I wanted to welcome Jessica Lachlan up to the stage for our final presentation. Um, her background's in the li uh, livestock supply chain with Greenham. Greenham? Greenham. Um, so obviously someone really in the know with this sort of stuff. So um, Jess, has, in her time at Greenham, uh, Greenham um, has managed the delivery of two new programs. Um, to suppliers and customers, including the Beef Sustainability Standard and the Grenham Dairy Beef Program. Um, and she, over the last decade, she's worked in red meat and processing sector across livestock, sales, business, development and finance. Um, and she's a real passionate advocate for the beef industry. So please welcome Jess to the stage. Always a fun thing to figure out the IT. Um, so everyone loves a mission statement, so I thought I'd start here. But uh, in the last couple of years, our team at Greenham has changed quite substantially. So the business went through a bit of an exercise of figuring out the role we wanted to play and how we wanted to present and promote ourselves, uh, in particular in our international markets, but also in the way we interact with producers. Um, Peter Greenham was challenged to come up with a bit of a mission statement and be very beneficial to the area of the business I work in. Um, he came up with that our mission is to inspire the world to be proud about beef. Um, and that's not only in you know, how we align our production practices with you know, evolving consumer values and those sorts of things, but also how we deliver our programs and our claims and our product with really strong integrity and with really high quality so that consumers are you know, really confident in the product, they understand how it aligns with their value, how it's good for their health, um, you know, how it's good for the animal, how it's good for the planet, can be really confident in those things and also go home and enjoy a really, really good quality meal as well. Really quick intro to the business, just to contextualise what we're doing in this space and how. Um, Green and Family's been in the industry for six generations, so started out butchering uh, cattle in the western suburbs of Melbourne, have grown to now have three processing plants, uh, with our closest one to here being our plant in Tongala. Um, for context, that plant has been newly redeveloped, which you might have heard about, um, and pressure uh, <laughs> in terms of getting the kill up there. Um, we're aiming to get that to about 1,000 head per day, so 5,000 a week. We're currently at about 400 a day, so still really working with developing the team there, getting them used to chill boning. Uh, that plant used to be purely a hot boning plant, so very much aimed at the manufacturing beef market, but with a really, really strong growth that we've seen with our customers and globally and demand for program beef and, and really high quality product, we've converted that plant to be able to supply um, those programs as well. So over the next 12 months, we'll be building that production up and therefore um, have a lot of availability to take on really good quality program cattle as well. Um, our key markets at Greenham, so something you'll notice is a little bit different to sort of the average Australian production. Uh, we're not only export focused, it's well and truly where the majority of our meat goes. Roughly 10% of our product stays here in Australia. Very strong focus there on high-end retail, um, high-end restaurant business. So very much the branded end of things here in Australia. Uh, and about 90% goes overseas with 70% roughly, give or take, depending on markets and number of cattle we're processing um, going to the US. Two reasons for that strong focus. Um, the original Tongala plant focused on, you know, cull cows and bulls um, was set up to service institutions in the US. So, you know, aged care homes, schools with basically safe mince meat um, to go into those school food programs and things. So we had a really strong customer base there. Um, and then as we've purchased the other plants, um, we've had a really strong focus on high quality grass-fed beef. We're in great uh, regions for finishing high quality grass-fed cattle uh, in this part of Australia. And uh, there's been a really, really strong growing trend there in the US with people looking for natural alternatives. Um, as you'd be aware, they've got a pretty big population over in the US, so it only takes a niche market given our production size and things to really create quite a premium opportunity. Um, but it's one that's really been growing in the past couple of decades and, and one we've been able to as Australia really set up some strong programs and, and deliver on that need. Uh, so the way we do it, we've got a series of on-farm programs that underpin all our various different brands in different markets. Um, but the biggest one of those is our Never Ever Beef program, which is our grass-fed program. Um, you can see there on the right, there's a few claims we make under that. First and foremost, that product is 100% grass-fed, so it's never been fed uh, cereal grains. Um, but also we incorporate into that program antibiotic-free, 
hormone-free, GMO-free, um, free range, and also certified humane, which is a US-based animal welfare claim um, that was introduced to the program in 2017. We saw a really, really strong appetite from our customers, particularly in the US, um, to be able to provide confidence through an on-pack claim um, of that welfare component. They're, they're getting a lot of questions and that particular certification, despite being US-based, uh, it's got really, really strong consumer recognition and hundreds of customers and stores who've taken that claim on. So it opens up those markets by incorporating into our program. Uh, my predecessor did an excellent job working with that certification body to contextualise those standards to an Australian production system uh, and integrate them straight into the program so producers aren't having to go above and beyond what the program sets out. Um, most of those requirements fit really, really nicely into an Australian production system anyhow. Um, probably just a couple of points to make on the program to give you a bit of scale when we're looking at integrating new claims and things. Uh, we've got about 4,400 accredited producers in our Never Ever program. Uh, it makes up nearly half of our total production at Greenham, um, and we're getting cattle from all of the eastern states under that program as well. So no small feat in terms of um, when we're looking particularly around things like sustainability and how we apply that to that um, particular program and geography. We've already seen that is hugely variable. Um, you know, just as you move along the Murray River, let alone up and down the entire east coast of Australia. So we have a pretty variable environment that we're working with, a large number of producers of all different sizes, backgrounds, um, and everything that we need to consider there. So what are our customers looking for next in this space? And I'm gonna be very customer focused and a little less investor focused in this space because we are still a private family company. So the investor pressure other than our friendly neighborhood bank uh, is a little lighter for us. And a lot of these initiatives have been first and foremost, very customer driven for us. That's not to say we don't get those other pressures, but um, we've been able to be quite responsive to those because we've already been moving to capitalize on premium markets. Um, so in talking to our customers, the essentially the things they're really looking for is to maintain confidence from consumers. Um, depending on where you live, and I got a bit of a culture shock <laughs> moving to Melbourne a few years ago, um, beef can get a different rap in different areas and there's a lot of misconceptions around the role of beef in the environment and how that plays out in different environments and, and globally and things. They want people to keep eating beef, they want them to be confident um, and they want help really selling that story. Um, so, you know, we regularly get actually sent direct customer questions, consumer questions from global customers and say, hey, can you answer this for us so we can go back with some accurate facts um, and give them some confidence. But underpinning all that, um, they really, they want data. They want to know that there's evidence behind that and that somebody's coming in and auditing that. So that if they're putting a claim on pack and saying, hey, don't worry, this is good for the planet or good for the animal, um, that you know, they don't have to worry that somebody's going to come and trip them up and say, well, actually, that's not happening. Um, it only takes one bad seed in the supply chain to potentially put the whole thing at risk. Um, fantastic thing about programs and brands, they can deliver excellent premiums, but people know what to avoid if they have a bad experience. So really, really important that that integrity is there and that it's really consistent across the whole supply chain. Um, one trend we've really seen, and you've seen probably the word regenerative up there a couple of times today, um, but we've got some of our key customers have started to introduce regenerative products into their range. So um, when we think about beef, it's not just the premium steak on the menu. Um, these are a couple of products um, for customers of ours that they've recently introduced. One is a regenerative bone broth. It's uh, really a big health food movement. I think we actually have a Greenham Cake Grim bone broth as well, which our marketing person was really actively promoting until she tasted it, but there is a real trend <laughs> of that out there and people want to consume these sort of products for their health, but the sort of person who's buying that also wants to know they're not harming the planet in the process. Um, over on the right is a very American product, as you can probably tell, it's called the Do Good Dog, um, and that is from our customer Applegate. They are a natural hot dog company, believe it or not, hot dogs and hamburgers, everyone wants them grass-fed and hormone-free and regenerative these days. Um, and they're actually looking to transition 100% of their beef um, product range to this Do Good Dog and see a real opportunity in uplifting sales by about 50% in the next three years by transitioning to this packaging and this labeling. So pretty big trend we're starting to see. 
why regenerative? And don't worry, I've asked them this a lot because when we first approached this with our producers, um, I got a bit of backlash. So spent a bit of time really digging through that and what it meant to them and why that was the word that resonated. Because when we think about trying to make a purchasing decision and having confidence that that's delivering on our needs and meeting our values and good for the environment, I am just getting my head around what good looks like in beef, let alone every other product on the market. I was trying to buy some balloons for a friend's party recently and uh, I got told that balloons were being cancelled because they were bad for the environment and I went, well, I want balloons. There's got to be good ones out there. I spent like two days going down rabbit holes and either I got conned with the world's most expensive balloons or there really is some kind of natural latex out there that's okay. But people just do not have the time to invest in making these individualised decisions for everything they purchase and consume. They want to know it's been done and they want to move on and have a guilt-free experience. Regenerative, and particularly in the US, is really changing that conversation because a consumer over there sees animals in very, very large um, feedlots where they spend a high percent of their life. It's a pretty big, um, different production system to ours. They're hearing that's bad for the environment. They don't think it's natural. It's not what they see, a cow skipping out in the fields. And they go, well, hang on. I'm hearing that beef isn't the problem it's maybe not so bad for the environment. There is a way we can produce this and manage, you know, well-managed grass-fed beef that can be done in a way that's really good for the planet. And when we dig into what those requirements are, it aligns really nicely with our production systems in this part of the country, which is a big win for Australia. Um, really, it's around reframing that conversation, moving away from the defensive to a proactive conversation where you can enter in through that shared values, which is really important. Um, and. I guess comments from customers is they like an outcome focused approach. We've heard a fair bit about outcomes and how important that is, and they like the focus that takes. There was a really interesting study done a couple of years ago. It's available online by Beef and Lamb New Zealand. New Zealand see likewise a real opportunity to capitalise on this regenerative movement and think their production aligns with that quite nicely. So they did an extensive consumer study. Um, they looked at consumers in the US, the UK, and Germany, being three of their major markets. And I think that's really well aligns with the slide that Sally put up this morning too around those real opportunity markets for Australia. Um, and you can see at the top there, regenerative, regenerative organic, followed by climate. And we've actually got carbon sort of further down the bottom. So in terms of those claims that actually resonate with consumers around you know, having that positive impact, the regenerative was scoring really highly. So all that in mind, what is Greenham actually doing? Um, so we've developed a green and beef sustainability standard. It's been quite a piece of work over the past few years. I walked into the business um, end of 2020. We had a first draft that had been developed with a producer reference group, and I thought, great, we'll have this to market in six months. That did not happen. Um, but essentially what this is, is really about future-proofing our grass-fed program. Over time, we'll look to adapt this to each of our various different production systems, collecting this data, providing this assurance across all our brands as a priority. But given the kind of consumer purchasing that Never Ever brand, it is first and foremost um, front of mind for them. So we've introduced this as an opt-in program for our Never Ever Crunch producers, uh, taking very much the carrot approach. Um, and we've closely aligned it with the Australian um, beef sustainability framework and industry goals like CN30. Really importantly, there was extensive consultation in how we developed this. So we had, as I mentioned, a producer reference group. We then piloted it with another 20 producers um, and actually applied this on farm to see how that played out and got feedback. Uh, we had scientists involved right throughout the development and then had an independent review done by um, the team at Integrity Ag and Environment, um, as well as getting some overseas um, <coughs> certification bodies to review it as well. So there was pretty extensive consultation um, and also very importantly not to leave out our customers. So we spent a lot of time with our customers saying what do you want to know in this space um, but really importantly what I got put to our farmers what will they pay for because people aren't going to want to do all this extra stuff for nothing. Um, so we really spent a lot of time teasing that out with them. In terms of what's in the program you can get it online and I'll put a QR code up later that you can access um, but as I said, it's aligned with the beef sustainability framework, so it covers off on those same four themes. Um, animal welfare, we've already got that certified humane accreditation as a baseline, so we're really just filling in a couple of gaps. Um, <clears throat> environmental stewardship, 
the most comprehensive area, the one we get the most questions, although also the one that has the most regional nuance. So there is a fair bit in that, but don't fear, we've done as much as possible to make it fairly simple and easy, um, as well as um, economic resilience and people and community. And people and community, while not particularly difficult, is often a very new area for people. Um, but we're really lucky there is a lot of good government support and they've given us some great templates as well to provide to producers to get them started in this space. Um, <clears throat> sorry guys, haven't been out of the house for a while. Um, so one important thing for the producer group that helped us build this was about having stages they could work through. So there are three tiers of achievement in the standards. It's not just a you're in or you're out type thing. Tier one is really around prioritising that education, setting a bit of a baseline, um, but also that sort of compliance piece. So making sure we really are um, complying with our, you know, legal responsibilities in this space. In most cases we are, but we don't actually audit or document evidence for that. So it's really difficult in a conversation with a customer to say, yeah, this happens on all farms in our supply chain. We can say, well, it's legislation in Australia. And then they say, do you audit that? So this gives us that ability to um, integrate that into our audits and also to really start to engage um, producers in topics like carbon where there is a lot of um, confusion and people are just wanting to learn more or not sure where to start. Moving through to tier two, that's really about setting goals um, and relevant strategies to your farm, but also getting measurement processes in place if you don't have them already, so that you be, can be collecting data to demonstrate that evidence for your performance. Um, and then tier three, I simply just call it the goalpost. We know goalposts do shift over time, but that's really about that alignment with our longer term industry goals, um, really recognising that absolute best practice across all different areas and really trying to make sure there's no nasty surprises coming at us from international markets. So if we're seeing things happen in Europe and we're starting to hear new conversations, Europe do often leave the way around um, a lot of the reform in this space. So it helps us to integrate that into the standard, start the conversation, and then by the time it comes to us, we've actually got a really robust data set around what's happening on our farms, but also where some of these things aren't practical um, and evidence behind how we're actually addressing that in a really practical way in our environments. <clears throat> What's in it for producers? I'm guessing I'm going to have to wrap this up quickly. So um, we asked our various pilot and reference group producers why they participated. In their words, um, they felt it was important for the future of the industry. Um, they were interested in supporting education, demonstrating industry leadership, supporting um, continual improvement, aligning with customer requirements, um, being able to tell their story. So anything that's going to be coming through on our branding and our socials in this space will be direct from producers' mouths. We've done a lot of case studies with producers and, and videos and things. Um, but really importantly, we've heard a lot today about all this noise and confusion and not sure where to start. What we've really tried to achieve with the standards is to take that all and put it in a place where producers can understand across all these different areas where they're at today, where there's opportunities for their farm and where they can practically go. So I said about not making this scary or threatening. Um, we spend a hell of a lot of time in developing these standards, getting supporting resources and tools in place. Um, very early on, we realised there was a bit of a gap around easy, free education in the carbon space. So we partnered with Pinion Advisory and MLA to develop these carbon e-learning modules. There are four of them. The first two are really about building your knowledge base in carbon and the next two are about actually taking you through building an account and starting to um, decipher what that means for you and where there's opportunities. Um, and then we've also developed management plan templates for all various different areas under the program um, that may be quite new to people and where producers said they didn't know where to start. None of those are required, but they're a guide um, and give people a place to start if they're not sure. And in terms of how we are marketing this to the consumer, no surprise that the first claim we've had approved off the standard given the customer interest is a regenerative one. Um, I mentioned that when we took those customer requirements and looked at how that actually applied in our production systems, there was a really nice overlap. About 95% of the things the customers were asking for were already delivered under those program standards that the producers developed. Um, so there was some really nice alignment. So we worked through with our customers to actually develop a certified regenerative claim. Um, and that's been endorsed by Integrity Ag and Environment and is approved for label use in the US and in Australia as well. If you are interested in the program, just want to know more, you can scan that QR code or just go to our website and find your way through to the um, page. That 
you can access the standards on there, read a little more. Um, in terms of what's in it for you, we are currently um, offering a 10 cent per kilo premium for accredited cattle um, that come through the program standards where they achieve tier two or three. Most properties we've been auditing to date, um, producers who are interested can get through to tier two reasonably easily with a bit of support. So it's not completely new in most cases, it's just some new records or those sorts of things. So um, we haven't actually started production in the mainland yet. We've been producing this in Tassie now about 120 week for the last year. Um, we're about to kick off production on the mainland in April, um, just started conducting our first round of audits. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, it'll be available to you very soon here. So encourage you to put forward some interest, look at the accreditation or even just see, you can complete a self-assessment and just see where you might fit and if it's something you want to explore further. Thanks, Jess. That was fantastic. A lot of information. And we do have time for a couple of quick questions before morning tea. But I guess something that I've really taken away from that session is this is really happening. This is really happening. And there's some opportunities that you can jump on already. You're going to get presented with quite a lot of codes today. Um, so keep taking the photos and they'll um, link you up with things that are actually happening out there.